Whenever we attempt to interpret the actions of our Lord, one great principle is always at the forefront, beautifully enunciated by St. Thomas Aquinas, which says, Omnis Christi actio nostra est instructio. Now, even if you be not a Latinist, you've heard me say it enough times that you probably know well what it means. What is it? All the actions of Christ are for our instruction. And so, for example, whenever he asks a question, is it so that he might cure his ignorance because he doesn't already know? Or because he is testing those whom he is questioning? It's obviously because he's testing them. When he prays, he is in fact God. And yet he prays to give us an instruction so that we might see him doing what he will later tell us. Pray always. Be always in a spirit of prayer. Now, what's interesting about prayer is that so often the Gospels tell us that he passes long hours of the night in prayer, which makes the present episode all the more interesting. Surely he was wearied in his human nature from his relentless, from his constant preaching, And so he has taken a moment of respite. He has gotten into the boat and told the apostles to put out onto the Sea of Galilee. But rather than being on the the bow of the boat praying, it says that he is asleep. Now, although, again, he may be tired, he's never overcome by these things. He's never overcome by any human passion, any human weakness. And so if he is asleep, it's only because he has chosen to be asleep. And beyond that, it only boggles the mind to think of what's going on inside of this mind of a man-god. Because even if he be asleep, he knows everything that's going on, does he not? After all, as you will hear, or at least read in the last gospel, that all things were made through him. Without him, nothing is made that was made. In him we live and move and have our being. And so suffice to say that everything from you know, the atomic electron orbits to the slow turning of the spiral galaxies and the winds and the rains and everything that's happening on the Sea of Galilee is all contained somehow in that divine mind which has also become flesh. All that's happening on the boat. Now, with that in the background... A little pop quiz, this might tax our memories a little bit. We have also talked extensively about Thomas Aquinas' teaching on the conditions for efficacious prayer. Starting to ring a bell a little bit? Maybe? All right. Try hard here. What are those five conditions of efficacious prayer? Confidence. Confidence. Okay, good. That's one. Four more to go. Pardon? I, sorry, I didn't hear Humility, yes, good. Two. Order. Order, Three. Suitability. Suitability. Good, we're on a roll. And from someone else, how about the left side? (laughs) We attempt to carry out this great prayer known as the Holy Sacrifice of the Mass with devotion. devotion. Okay, all right. You got them all now. Order, suitability, confidence, devotion. I say humility? Which one am I missed? Okay, now we have to do it from the beginning. Order, suitability, confidence, humility, devotion. Okay, now we have five. Now consider the various petitions that people bring to our Lord and some of the obstacles they meet. You can probably surmise maybe what was deficient in their prayer, what may have been lacking. For example, a man comes to our Lord seeking a cure for his child, and he says, Lord, if you can do anything, please help me. How does our Lord respond? If, if I can do anything, will you will have a little faith. To which he responds, Lord, please help me. Help my unbelief. Help my unbelief. There are other times in which, let's say, petitions are posed that are lacking in some respect. For example, when the mother of James and John, Lord, Lord, command that my son sit at your right and left. What's lacking there? Humility, probably. Probably suitability as well. How could that prayer have been better framed or that petition better framed? Yeah. 
How about this? Seek first the kingdom of God, and all these things shall be added unto you. Lord, command that my sons may always serve your greater glory. It's pretty much an infallible petition, right? Meets all the conditions. What about another? Hmm. Lord, shall we call down fire from heaven to consume them? No, that's not quite suitable. If you go through these various passages in the Gospels, you can kind of tease out maybe what was lacking, what our Lord is trying to correct. And so now let's combine these two things. Let's bring all those things to bear on this context, this very short Gospel passage. Here our Lord is sleeping on the boat. We've established that this must be for their testing and for their instruction. And so a great storm stirred up. It must have been quite a storm. The Sea of Galilee is not all that big. And these, for the most part, are seasoned fishermen. If you've ever been out on the water stuck in a, in a storm, it is something of a frightful thing. You realize that you're pretty much a lightning rod out there. And then it says that the, the boat was being tossed about by the waves. So for a bunch of seasoned fishermen to feel that they were on the verge of perishing, it must have been something rather terrifying. And it says, at least in the translation, that they awakened him. Now, the Latin says, et suscita verunt eum, which probably better rendered is something like this. They went and grabbed him and shook him, Lord, we're, we're perishing, help us do something. And it's interesting to think, what did they expect? On the one hand, did they expect him to just grab a pail and help bail water? Probably not. But then, on the other hand, when he stands up, rebukes them, why are you fearful, ye of little faith? And then rising up, he commanded the winds and the sea, and there came a great calm. And it says, but they wondered, saying, what manner of man is this? So on the one hand, they're so desperate, they're just saying, help us. They don't really know what he can do or what he will do. And then when he does something, like, wow, he did it. And so I suppose you might say that they have faith. They have some sort of faith, probably cu coupled with desperation, help us. But they must think that he can do something. But then when the new Adam rises up and commands that all things be still, they just wonder, how did this happen? Who is he? What manner of man is this? I guess at this point it hasn't fully sunk in, even though they've already seen certain miracles. Wedding Feast of Cana, for example. They're still wondering, what kind of man is this? What kind of prophet is this? And so we can see probably the first thing that was lacking was confidence. Why are you fearful, O ye of little faith? We might ask ourselves, what else may have been lacking? When they were on the sea... What were they thinking? What were they doing prior to that storm coming up? It must have come up all of a sudden. Again, being seasoned fishermen, they probably would have been able to read the signs of the weather, know what was coming. How is it that they were taken so off guard? And what were they doing right before it came? Were they discussing the events of the day? Were they discussing the very man who was asleep in the boat? Or maybe were they, I don't know, playing the first century Galilean equivalent of Euchre on the boat or something? But where were their minds? What were they doing that when this storm came up, that all of a sudden, after they had seen what was probably the marvelous preaching of that day and the preceding weeks, and even the miracles that may have accompanied it, how is it that all of a sudden that they're caught so off guard that in absolute desperation they shake our Lord, do something? I think we could probably also surmise that there was something lacking in the order and suitability. And this, in fact, is perhaps one of the hardest of those conditions to learn and practice. For example, if their hearts were at complete calm and tranquility, as they would one day later be when they were those indomitable saints and apostles spreading the gospel, I suppose their prayer would have been something like this. Well, God is on the boat. Nothing's going to happen lest he will it. And therefore, let, let whatever come. And perhaps if... If this boat is meant to perish, if we lose our livelihood, if we lose this boat, he'll provide something else. And if we lose our lives, I guess it was meant to end here, although that seems unlikely. But I think the point of this is that it shows that confidence also has to be coupled with those other petitions, with suitability and order. 
And I'll give you a, a perfect example of that. Take this sign of St. Peter here. The sign of his final triumph, his final achievement, when he followed our Lord in his very footsteps to the cross. Now imagine if his prayer had been something like this. Lord, I am so confident. I am absolutely convinced that you are going to deliver me from this cross. It may have been a prayer filled with confidence, but what would it be lacking? Order and suitability. For our Lord had prophesied to him, Peter, one day you will show how much you love me. And you will triumph. And it will be in this manner. One day, another will dress you and lead you where you do do not want to go. And you will spread out your hands. And by this, you will glorify God. I imagine when that finally came to pass, Peter was fulfilling all those conditions. Yes, Lord, the time has come. This is what you told me about. And if this be for your greater glory, then so be it. Let it be done unto me according to your will. And I am confident that you will make all things work for your good. And in point of fact, that became the truly defining moment of Peter's life. It was the seal on his whole apostolic mission. It was the very moment in which he most perfectly followed in the footsteps of Christ. The prince of the apostles, the very first pope, lays down his life for his friends, just as his master had done. And so perhaps we can bring things full circle now by asking, what would have happened? What would have happened if the apostles had all prayed in such a perfect manner? I suppose the storm would have rose up. I suppose they would have had to fight mightily. And yet, they would not have perished, for it was not their time. And afterwards, they may have asked our Lord, Lord, why did you, why did you allow us to undergo that? And here I'm reminded of a beautiful story from St. Catherine of Siena. One time when she was enduring terrible temptations to the extent that the devil himself was presenting all sorts of horrible things to her mind. And she cried out, Lord, Lord, help me, help me, do something. And she felt nothing. She heard nothing. She continued to be tormented by these temptations. But she fought, she resisted, and finally, once again, peace and calm was restored. And yet she had one gripe. She protested to God and said, Lord, where were you? I turned to you in my hour of need, and I felt nothing. I heard nothing. God said to her, Catherine, were you tempted? Well, yes, Lord, you know that I was tempted. And did you want to give in? No, Lord, I didn't. I didn't want any of those things. I hated them. That's why I asked you to take them away. And the Lord said, did you succeed in resisting? Yes, after much trial and combat, yes. He says, well, how did that come about? Who did that? Do you think that was from you? For I never left you. I was with you always. In nomine Patris, Filii et Spiritus Sancti. Amen.